Um, so our next speaker is somebody I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce. Um, and I like to tell the story of when I first met Rudolf. Um, we were both postdocs in San Diego. And I was at UCSD. And he was at the Salk working with Beatrice Mintz. And he was beginning his work on infecting early mouse embryos with retroviruses to see what would happen. And I went to his talk at the Salk, and I was blown away. I was blown away by the talk, and I was blown away by how well it was delivered, and I was blown away by the fact that he had a ponytail halfway down his back. <laughs> and I was brave enough at the end of his talk to go down and congratulate him on what I thought was just a wonderful talk. And I was so pregnant, I could hardly waddle down to the podium. <laughs> and I remember him standing there going, <laughs> as if I were just about to deliver. Rudolf has had a wonderful career. He started in Germany, uh, went to medical school, tells us he hated it, then went to graduate school, was at the Max Planck for a few years, and in the mid-80s, about the same time I was recruited to Boston, David Baltimore recruited Rudolf to the Whitehead Institute, and he has done wonders with Whitehead. I would have, if I'd been con more conscientious, I would have listed all the awards that Rudolph has gotten. But he has always been the front runner. In 2013, he agreed to give the dinner talk for this meeting. And at that dinner talk, he instructed all of us on the ins and outs of CRISPR-Cas and exactly how we were going to use all these tools for genetic manipulation. He is a master at manipulating the mouse, but mostly he is a master at figuring out what is the next problem we can really ask and answer? It's easy to ask a lot of problems, but Rudolf always has a way to figure out which one can I actually answer next. And I know that one of his, one of his current interests is in multi-gene diseases. How can you model multi-gene diseases, which has always been a real challenge. So it's with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce my friend Rudolf Janisch, who is professor at the Whitehead Institute at MIT. Thank you very much, Anne. It's really fun for me to think about these old days at Salk. <laughs> so, I have a disclosure. So, first of all, it's a different title in the, the program. Um, so, there are two titles, and none of those has anything to do with circadian rhythm. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm uh, sort of a bit uh, an outsider here. But anyway, so um, I want to talk about most human mouse chimeras and what they could be useful for. Um, and just I'm advising to a couple of companies. So obviously uh, IPS cell systems, ES cell systems are really useful to make any cell type as we you know they're really for disease modeling and for generating <clears throat> maybe um, understanding of diseases and drug discovery. But we have to think about approaches to model diseases in culture. That's what people mostly do, their limitations. And so we have 2D cultures, which are really great. We can make any cell type. But of course, cells don't live in a 2D space. So they're limited um, what they can say. The organoids really is a partial solution. They are now three-dimensional. They're more complex. And they recapitulate developmental function and functional aspects of complex organs, and they're easy to manipulate. But if you want to really study diseases, there are a couple of other issues you have to consider. Many diseases have a developmental origin. You need to study, for example, cancer, the initiation, the progression, and the manifestation of the disease. And that's difficult in either of these systems. So we need to go back and think about a vivo approach to study human diseases. Well, transgenic animals was the first one. You could do anything with that. And in an example, the red mouse is really a very, uh, mimics very well the human disease led to clinical trials. But limitations are many mutations in the mouse, many of these transgenic animal systems really don't reflect at all the human disease. Mice and humans are diff different, they have different genes which are important. So that's, and the first example was Dash 9. The Lash 9 mouse was the first knockout mouse, very easy to be done, and people thought um, HPRT knockout would, would mimic the Lash 9 disease. It does not. 
because there's really a difference in metabolism. Then the transportation, you can use human cells. It's a very successful approach um, and, and to, to study, for example, cancer or other things. But it's really only one stage disease, the end stage. So that's really, you can't study anything before the end stage, and you need immunocompromised hosts. IPS cells, perfect. They're human. They're relevant for human cells. You can do any stage. But it's in, in vitro. Essay, of course, limited by that. So, can you combine IPS Cs with transgenic animal approach and make human mouse cameras? So, that's what I want to really talk about. And so, this is an interesting paper from um, uh, Hiro Nakauchi, where he generated, he put red ear cells into a mouse and saw that they could contribute to make a chimera. And the key conclusions were that these donut cells contribute to all lineages in the chimeric animals. They have a lower contribution. The older the animal was, the lower the contribution was. There was selection against high contribution. Um, and so people have this type of system, make human animal chimeras to make organ donors. It's being discussed. Um, I think, so make, for example, a, a, a human pancreas in a, in, a, in, a, in a pig. I think the interspecies chimera formation, as done now here by plus injection, is inefficient. And any chimera information, I will tell you, depends on evolutionary distance. So I am not sure if this is going to be easy to, to realize in that system. So how do you make chimeras? Well, by plus injection, that's a conventional way. Or you could do it later with committed stem cells. Of course, they don't belong in the blood as I will tell you, but they belong when they arise. And so that's what I, and of course, this is now the advantage that you incorporate this in the mouse, and you can study now human cells in, in the developmental context. And I'm going to talk about this approach manipulating embryos in utero. So, why do you want to make interspecies animal chimeras? I told you. Model study post implantation stages of human development. People want to do this in vivo modeling of neural crest diseases, organ donors. I'm going to talk about neural crest. <laughs> the neural crest is a fascinating lineage. So, the neural crest arises when the tube closes and, and they migrate over long distance. There's dorsal lateral migration, which forms all the pigment cells, and the ventral one, which forms, for example, the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And they form the bones of the face and so on and so forth. So this is really the many, many different cell types which arise from the, from the neural crest, the enteric nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and so on, and the pigment system, and many others. And then many, many diseases, obviously, and there's the listing a few cancers and, and so on and so forth. So the technical issue is how could you generate a neural crest chimera? And so the first one's one of this one from um, uh, Nicole Dolan in the 60s. This was this chicken quail chimera machine. It was made by transplanting a piece of the tube from the quail to the chicken. And there was uh, the pigment as seen here. For me, the key paper probably I read in my whole career was this one from Beatrix Smith, published in 67, where she sort of aggregated the black and the white embryo and made these chimeras and got these stripes from the request, obviously, and she concluded in this paper from uh, the pattern of the stripes, what happens when the neural crest rises from the, from the tube. So it's a retrospective analysis, rather complicated. It's an interesting paper to read, and I still don't totally understand why she got this result. But anyway, it, it fascinated me for many reasons, and when I joined, so if you want to study neural crest, you have to introduce it not early, far before they arise, but at the stage when they arise from the tube. That was my reasoning. So the first experiment I did when I joined the Whitehead Institute was really to generate neural crest chimeras by injecting basically neural crest cells into the embryo in utero. And I just have to go briefly through it because that's what happened. So this was explanted tubes, whatever grows out at this stage I declared as neural crest, there was no marker for this and it injected those in utero, it's a blind injection, um, where you think the embryo is. And to my surprise, going down to the nose, we found these animals which had these black spots clearly from the donor cells, were black in a biopsy. 
And one conclude there were two conclusions. One is it was a very narrow window of twelve hours, not before, not after. And it was never a contribution to the to the forwards and the anterior trunk. It was sort of strange. And so the injection occurs into the amnion cavity. That's the biggest amnion cavity you have, and in 30% you hit it. It's just, so that's where the, the cells end up. And the tube is still open, here and here. So my idea was maybe that's where these cells can enter and that they can't really migrate laterally because the niches are full. So you have to empty the niches, and if you do that, now you get these chimeras, which have really extensive chimeric, and you can actually uh, inject two colors uh, as donor cells, and you get these triple colored mice, where you can see clonal uh, black ones on the brown ones, and, and these are no, no, no crest star. So basically, the, the primary neural crest stars from the mouse have a high prolif proliferation and migration capacity. Okay. So, coming to human, we can make neural crest cells from human, I, I, we can make all the cell types from human yes cells, and uh, they can differentiate all the cell types, I don't want to go into this in any detail, they can make also pigment cells when I come back. So the experiment I'm going to talk about is from Malky Kuhn, he did most of the experiments I will talk, he's a postdoc in my lab and he's leaving soon. So, what he, first of all, that we teach him how to inject in utero, and he but it was very satisfying for me after 30 years to, to, to teach him this. And now we had a GFP mark and we could see the, these mouse cells migrating under the skin contributed, for example, to, to, my, uh, to, to Schwann cells and so on and forth. So they could contribute um, extensively to, to uh, pigmentation and neural derivatives. So that was fine. Um, we did this now with the yes cell arrived, mouse and red yes cells, and I will not talk about this, and then with your. That's really what I mostly want to talk about. So, to remind you, the injection is into the amnion cavity, so outside of the embryo. So these cells have to get through the epithelium into the embryo. And when you do this now with um, GFP labeled human no crest cells, you can see them, they migrate under the skin and they contribute to its dorsal root ganglia. And for example, here they would be uh, contributing to the trigeminal. So the conclusion was, human neural crest donor cells migrate under the epidermis, the dorsal lateral pathway, and contribute to neural derivatives. And we can make postnatal mice. And when you look, these postnatal mice are on a mutant background. They are a CK mutant, so the endogenous melanoblasts die. And the black hair, which you see here, um, appears. And when you plug it, it's human DNA in those. So, what we can conclude from this, and you can see here, this is, for example, a hair follicle where the, where the human um, uh, GFP can be stained. So, clearly you can establish human cells in a developing embryo and they mature and form functional cells. Now, the efficiency is very different. So, this with primary neural crest cells, they become 20 to 80 percent, come here in 30 percent or so of the injections. If you use cells derived from ES yes cells, it really goes down. Mouse ES yes is around to 5%, rat to 0.5 to 5%, and human even less. So the conclusion would be the overall efficiency of chimera formation is similar, depends on how you value inject, just a technique. But the primary neural crest cells are much more efficient than ES yes cell derived ones. So probably the ES yes cell derived ones are not as proliferative and embryonic or multipotent than the S cell derived, uh, than, than the primary ones. And clearly there's an evolutionary um, distance, so the further the evolution your way, the less efficient it is. Okay. So they can integrate, as I showed you, they contribute to um, to to ESRF to the much much lower than primary ones, and they're clearly um, functionally integrated. So why is chimera interspecies inter species formation so inefficient? And that's my only connection to timing. <laughs> how about this timing? So isochronic versus heterochronic transplantation. <coughs> so let me come to this. So chimeras, the timing transplantation could be isochronic. Transplantation would be ES cells in the blastocyst 
or no crest cells in the 8.5 gastrolytic embryo. That's where they belong. It's isochronic. Heterochronic would be donor cells are less advanced, so yes cells into the 8.5 embryo, or donor cells are more advanced, host cells, no crest cells into the blood cells. That would be heterochronic. So how important is matching of developmental differentiation stage of donor and recipient? So I'm going to summarize this experiment. So this would be the two stages we're looking at. Blastocysts in the gastrolating embryo. These are the two cells we want to put in, ES cells or no crest cells, cultured. And so this would be isochronic. And this would be, sorry, something else. This would be heterochronic. You want to see how that works. And I will not go through these experiments. I just want to summarize it. But <laughs> is that something I can do? Okay, so the, the result is very clear. This works well, isochronicity. I showed you these experiments. This is, of course, what everybody else does. When we do this, yes, cells into uh, those embryos that make tumors, teratomas, and here they don't do anything. So that is uh, even if you knock out these genes. So. The, the key conclusion, heterochronic injection of ES cells into mouse embryos failed to yield um, chimeras, and same in, in um, no crest cells into the blastocysts failed to yield an integration. So the, it reminds me of the phylotypic egg timer. When you look in different species, vertebrates, where they're most similar, they're very, they're very different strategies. In, pre-implantation development. They look, of course, turtles and whatever, uh, mice look very different uh, as adults. But at gastrulation, they look very similar. Right? That's what the bottleneck they have gone through. So, the, um, so, it, so they converge really at gastrulation is really the constraint. So gastrulation may be the most permissive stage to function into very interspecies cells. So that would be sort of the potential suggestion for this. Okay. So, what are they useful for, these cameras? So, you could ask, you can look at developmental issues, whatever, you want to really look at disease modeling. So, I'm going to give you an example. As I said, you no know, crest to uh, contribute to these, all these different um, tissue types and pigmentation for melanoma and um, the autonomic nervous system, neuroblastoma. And I will talk about neuroblastoma. So neuroblastoma is the most common extracranial solid tumor in childhood. It's a pretty bad diagnosis, and it really originates from the sympathetic nervous system, often coming out of um, on the adrenal. The conventional models are xenotransplantation. The limitations, of course, are only end-stage cells, and you must, must use an immune-compromised pulse. So people have done this a lot, but these are things the limitations. So what we wanted to do is to see whether we can put these cells, develop a neuroblastoma in, in a mouse chimera coming from, from a neural crest cells carrying the relevant mutations and see how it, how it compares to what you see in the patient and in child developing. So that was the idea. So the genes which lead to, um, to neuroblastoma are NMUC um, amplification and activation of the ALK pathway has been well established and to be made these mutations, toxin-usable uh, mutation of MUC or this, this mutant ALK. And, and so docs can activate those in vivo and in vitro, um, and, 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 and that was the, the system. Okay, so in vitro, when you make this, you, the, 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 they express, as you would expect, um, this is this, this the control, and they change their growth properties, so when you use these oncogenes, they grow faster, they form tumors, and you just make a xenotransplantation assay, and they have polymer formation differences. That is expected. So now we want to use these mouse mice and inject them, and then induce toxicity after injection, induce those, um, and that was the idea. And we had also labeled these donor cells also with the luciferous genes, we could look at the whole animal. And what we saw is, Indeed, over a month, we saw this tumor growth coming up. So clearly, cells which uh, had um, um, luciferase expressed, we could see, we could look at them, and they have tumors growing up uh, on the adrenal and the later um, orbit, uh, orbital space, and they express 
the, the, the donor cell, uh, the markers we have put in. Now, what are these tumors? When you look in a conventional xenograft, you find these very homogeneous tumors growing. That's typical. When you look in these human chimeric mice, they're very heterogeneous. They're actually very similar to patient-derived um, primary tumors, very different from the, the conventional model. So the tumors in all crest chimeras may resemble more faithfully primary human neuroblastomas, and this is the key. They grow in immunocompetent mice. So that was a big surprise for us. So we looked at section them, and these tumors were massively infiltrated with cytotoxic CD8 cells, <coughs> as for example here is shown. T cells, massively, in, so, but they still grow. So these tumors grow despite the host immune response. So the question is now, is there an induction of tolerance? So when you look at this, well, tolerance can come from, obviously, from, from uh, these, these uh, uh, TIM3 and PDL1, whatever is known in, in immune therapy of cancer, these, these uh, checkpoint inhibitors being, being expressed. But when we look at these tumors, they're massively also in, infiltrated with Tregs, with these markers, so T regulatory um, um, cells which inhibit the, the um, um, cytotoxic T cells, and they activate the checkpoint signals. TIM3 in the, in, the, in the mouse, in the host cells, and PDL1 in the tumor cells. So it's exactly what tumors, melanoma or so, in human tumors do, and that's what's being used you now to inhibit those for um, therapy, immune therapy. And they activate the stone eat me signal on macrophages, the human one. And when you look at difference in gene expression between um, these tumors, with this mouse and human, as, um, together with normal tissue, really the genes which are activated are really most consistent with a very strong inflammatory response. So it seems to be this equilibrium between tumor growth and, um, and, um, um, uh, and, and in inhibiting the immune response. When you look in transgenic models, which they never have any infiltration of CD8, but of course the infiltration with these um, chimeric tumors is very high. So, what are these T cells reacting to? They must be known. This is xenotransplantation. This is very complicated, actually, and I'm not an immunologist. So, so that's a problem. So, when we, what, what we can do is you can ask the question taking um, T cells from these chimeras and ask the question, what are they reacting to? What type of cells? We can let them react with just um, 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 nothing, so this will be sort of the assay, proliferation assay, um, with an irrelevant cell, or when they're artificially activated, they get to really proliferate. Uh, this would be in with no blastoma cells, which are not related, and those would be activated with either with our neural crest cells not activated the oncogenes, or after docs. You can see there's a much stronger activation after docs. So we believe part of the immune responses is against some antigens from these oncogenes. So the oncogene expression um, in B cells activate CD8 T cells consists with an oncogene specific response. So are they tolerant? So that's the question, how do they tolerate? So we ask the question, when you inject now these tumor cells either into immune competent chimeras or immune compromised chimeras, is there a difference in human development? There's not. So it seems to be they can grow perfectly well in these immunocompetent chimeras. We ask the question when, when you have a chimera and you wait for um, almost a year, would these chimeras? would they now be tolerized to a new injection into their flank? Right? Would they remember? And they do. So this would be the injection into an immunocompromised mysotoposal controller very fast, and this would be to 30% because we don't, we don't know who is chimeric, 30%, if they're not induced with the, with, with the oncogenes. And you can see they grow probably with a similar rate. So the conclusion would be here, 
yes, immunocompetent chimeras are tolerant to tumor growth of an additional injection. Now, they have tight cytotoxic T cells. Are they functional? Now, this is a big debate in, in, in the clinic. Right? I mean, you have the, 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 the uh, um, reaction against melanoma, the immune reaction, but the T cells don't function well. They, people think they are exhausted. So we ask that question. By taking out the spleen cells from a chimera or from a white mouse, and ask the question, can they be, um, um, how can you know Mix them, mix them and try to make, induce a tumor in an immune compromised mouse. How would these T cells inhibit this? And this is really, uh, it's maybe a little complicated for the audience, but anyway, when you take the tumors together with wild type T cells, which get activated, tumor growth gets rather rapidly inhibited. But if you take the T cells from a spleen, from a chimeric animal, Right? Then they, were, they didn't do very well. So this, from an immunological point of view, would think that T-cell tumor bearing cameras have impaired anti-tumor activity, which is really a term for talking about exhaustion. Okay, so that's how far we are. So let me just, uh, this is really our goal, to engineer human and bee development, or maybe melanoma development, in an in vivo model by using these type of cameras um, and find out whether we can really understand more about these human diseases in an in vivo context. So, clearly, I told you the human and see can integrate the development of those embryos. The neuroblastomas are more similar to primary human in, in bees than conventional xenograft models. This is the key, they go on immune competent mice. So, some of these um, in cells induce an immune response, but it gets blunted. So we don't quite exactly understand the central immunity versus peripheral immunity, but that's what, what we think. So it's, the tumors are invaded by cytotoxic T cells, they induce immune suppression by attracting T Rex and activate CD47 and the checkpoint inhibitors. The NB cells injected subcutaneous into chimeric mice from tumors. So they're tolerant. So what we hope that this way to introduce human cells into a developing embryo, most embryo in this case, might allow us to model diseases really in the initial stages as well as later stages in a bit more relevant environment than an immune compromised mouse as the, as the, the conventional models all have it. So what we hope to use is devising strategies to improve effectiveness of currently used immunotherapies by, uh, for example, restoring innate immune responses. We can use such a system to evaluate any novel immune therapies if you have, uh, if you can look at this, um, and in combination with cytotoxic therapies and possibly to identify new, new um, uh, targets. So that's about all what I wanted to tell you. And so this work was mostly done by, uh, all done by, by Mihilko's driver, Marky Kohn, and a lot of help from Stella. Uh, we worked together with uh, Stephanie Spranger, who is an immunologist at MIT, without this wouldn't work, and with Ronnie George um, from the Dana Farm. And my final remark would be, I'm looking for a postdoc interest in work, <laughs> no trace biology, and uh, disease violence. <laughs> So we haven't, we haven't done that, but we haven't, there's a model, even in these immune compromises, we have not seen the metastasis. But so is, isn't the neural crest really circadian in control? Oh, the neural crest have sure it is.
retinoblastoma for tumors instead of neural crest precursors, or whatever you do, into the same stage embryo. What happens to the tumor cells? Mm -hmm. We haven't done that. We assume they just form tumors right away, which would be like, so I don't know what would happen. Um, yeah, yeah done this. You mentioned about the sim cutting between uh, transplanted cells and post embryo. So I wonder if, uh, at least in the mouse uh, experience, we've done transplanting, say, glastomeres, maybe two four cell stage into glasses, if that actually This works. And that, you can do that. You can take, and that seems to be close enough. I mean, there was, beginning of 2000, there was this flood of papers, cell and uh, um, nature and uh, science, whatever, um, putting whatever cell they want to put into the blood system, and they got cameras. And there was this uh, blood to brain. I mean, there was a lot of all nonsense, but it was all artifact. And, and, and that's really uh, and wishful thinking, these papers. So I think the isochronicity is very important. These, these are pretty debunked, these, 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 these conclusions. So, um, and uh, of course, he has something you normally with the later and he may turn at all. But nothing, nothing useful. In human neuroblastomas, do you have also T cells that are exhausted? Well, it's interesting. Um, I believe there is a correlation with, depending on what it means, if you have MMIP amplification, I think it's rather less. But yes, there is some of this, 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 um, this, this in, in, uh, response. Yes. Do they know it is a mechanism? No. Of no. No. Is there a question online? Yeah, um, Dr. Sabelli. Uh, he says, uh, as always, awesome work. Thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, question one, can you speculate as to why the pig embryos that were injected with the human IPF, IPSC had such a low amount of human cells in the resulting fetus in reference to the 2017 cell paper from the Isuza, Bellamon, and Ross labs? Um, and question number two is, acknowledging that you are not an ethicist, in your view, in more differentiated human stem cells into a gastrulating pig or any other animal embryo would circumvent ethical challenges of chimeras done in pre-implantation embryos? Question mark why? Okay, so let me, and the first one, I, I just heard uh, uh, um, Don Carlos Belmonte talking about these uh, pig chimeras. And yes, he gets nice integration into the blood system. At this moment, if you look later, so, I mean, it's, so it's really not resolved. So that's really, I think, and the same is from what I understand from Hiro and Nakauchi. It hasn't been resolved. So the question is, if you, the challenge is enormous for this. If you put a human yes cells in the mouse blastocyst, the mouse blastocyst after implantation will divide with six hour cycle in the epiblast. The human cell with 18 hours. How would they ever compete? So this is, there are a lot of challenges. Which, which may not fit. So this probably is much closer when you go later. So, so I believe there's no good evidence for any efficiency of making these type of interspecies cameras um, at a later stage. Um, and the other one, the ethical issues. I mean, we did get um, um, the permission to, for example, inject human ES cells into most blastocysts and keep it until birth. And we utterly failed to get anything. So there's a lot of controversy about this. So we were totally unsuccessful. Um, and with the, with the multipotent cells, which are more restricted, I think the, the, the bar is low, absolutely. Um, would be much lower to do this. So I, I, I didn't encounter really um, any problems with our committees. Um, 